All right, go ahead and open in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 12. So this is uh, Palm Sunday, as you know. And just in case there is someone here who is listening that isn't quite sure what Palm Sunday is, or maybe you know what it is, you're just not exactly sure why it's called Palm Sunday. Let me just give a, a brief definition before we begin reading. Palm Sunday, obviously, is the Sunday before Easter, but it's considered a, a Christian holiday, a Christian feast day, commemorating the triumphal entry of Christ uh, into the city of Jerusalem. And this event was so important, it is one of those rare events mentioned in all four Gospels. So Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem in such a way to declare himself to the nation, to all the people in the city, that he was the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ, the King of Israel. And what happened was the people cut down palm branches and laid them uh, in front of Christ as he was seated on a, a donkey. And they laid them on the road much like we would lay out a, a red carpet for someone who's uh, of great importance. So before we begin in John chapter 12, uh, back in chapter 11, Jesus, for the sake of context, Jesus had performed one of his greatest miracles. And what was that miracle? It was the raising of Lazarus, who had been deceased for four days. Jesus raised him from the dead. Uh, the Jews were already plotting to kill Jesus at this point. And now with this miracle, they were so concerned, because it was so amazing, they were so concerned that it would cause everybody, it would cause the whole land to believe on Jesus. Uh, and they, they could not have that. So... Uh, they determined not only must he die, he must die now. He must die soon. And it's interesting, Jesus, in a sense, plays intentionally right into their hands. After all, this was the purpose of Christ coming into the world, the Lamb of God, to die for sinners. To die is a sacrifice. Let's begin reading John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. That may sound strange, but that wasn't totally abnormal back then. And it says the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold? for 300 denarii, which is like a, a year's salary, and given to the poor. And this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. He used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. And the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, 
took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. So that last statement is a, a quote from Psalm 118, which is a, a psalm of praise to God for his everlasting mercy. And in that psalm, it speaks about how Jesus is the stone. And of course, it doesn't identify him by name. We know that, but it identifies Christ. Uh, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So uh, Jesus, the rock, was rejected by men, but he was exalted by God. And the people cry out, Hosanna, which means what? How many of you know what Hosanna means? It means save now. This is what the people were calling for. They were calling for the Messiah to save now. So in the psalm, they cry out, I pray, save now. That's what it means. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Notice that. Send now prosperity. Now we know that the Jews who were excited on Palm Sunday were excited because the king was present. They were excited because they believed the kingdom was about to be ushered in. So the figure of the Messiah, he was seen by the Jews. He was going to be a warrior king. He would defeat the enemies of Israel, drive out the Romans, and establish a glorious, prosperous kingdom so that all the Jews would benefit from that. And that somewhat of a misconception uh, we we see and I'll explain more about that in a moment but we see that that's what the Jews were really looking for save now bring prosperity bring the kingdom bring all the benefits we see in that that they were really not concerned about their own sin they were really not concerned about God's righteousness and God's holiness and how it was being offended on a daily basis they just basically wanted something that would benefit themselves a, a place of prominence peace and prosperity in this this coming kingdom uh, this is why Israel in her history was always more inclined to follow after the false prophets over the true prophets of God because the false prophets were always offering those things all the things that people want and they would tell them this is what false prophets do they would tell the people what they wanted to hear now it's important to point out listen Jesus does offer these things okay but instead at least in in this current age Jesus he does offer peace but it's not necessarily peace between nations. It's, a, it's an inner peace. It's a spiritual peace. Jesus does offer treasures. But he says, lay up your treasures in heaven. So he doesn't necessarily offer material wealth. Instead of earthly prominence, depending on how one serves God in this life, a person may indeed have prominence, a place of prominence in the kingdom that is to come and listen let's not forget right the kingdom is at hand this is what jesus preached the king is present they were all looking for the kingdom there will be make no mistake about it there will be an earthly kingdom now, the day will come when jesus will conquer all of his enemies he will defeat a revived roman empire he will sit on a physical throne the prophets spoke about all of these things so here's the thing. The Jews were not necessarily wrong in thinking that. It's just that they didn't understand. And that's kind of the, one of the themes of this message is that sometimes people just don't understand what God is doing. They did not understand that Jesus, the Messiah, would have to die, rise again, ascend into heaven. There would be the first advent to pay for sin, the second advent to then bring in the kingdom. They, did, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. So Jesus came the first time 
we know why. And then the second time he will come for that final ultimate deliverance. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 says Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now that's the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews wasn't written uh, during uh, the time of Christ and the apostles around Palm Sunday. So again, the people, they didn't know. They didn't understand. Even the apostles, you remember this? They didn't understand. When Jesus told them, how many times did he tell them? I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified and I will rise again. Jesus told them that flat out and they, they just couldn't process it. They, they couldn't comprehend how that was possible. It's only after the fact that those things became clear. And that's the, the first uh, point, uh, the first application that I want to offer this morning. With God's people, sometimes, oftentimes, things aren't clear. We don't know what God is doing. So today is, is what? It's, it's April 5th, 2020. And we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Everything, everybody, all the time, all the news coverage, every aspect of our lives, it's all coronavirus, COVID-19, the virus, the virus, the virus. That's, that's all it is all the time. Some of us are trying to avoid that. You know, we might check the news for five minutes here. That's what I do. I might tune in for five minutes just to see if there's anything new. But many of us, yes, we will wash our hands. Yes, we're keeping our distance. Uh, yes, things have changed, but we refuse to live in fear. And when we look at what's going on, many of us will scratch our heads as Christians who believe the Bible have faith in God and we scratch our heads and say, what is God doing? What, what is God doing through all of this? You know, I know I scratch my head and think, well, gee, the, the liquor stores are still open. Walmart is still open. Burger King is still open. Dunkin' Donuts is still open, or at least it was Friday when I drove by. And I know some of you think that coffee is essential, all right? But hey, get a Keurig. I think it's better, number one. Number two, it'll save you money in the long run, but you can do it at home. But this is the testimony. Walmart and Burger King are open for business, but all the churches in the land are shut down. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So Dunkin' Donuts is open. The pot dispensaries are open. Open and listen, if somebody wants to sit on their couch and smoke their brains out, I guess that's their business. But what are God's people doing? What is God doing through all of this? How can this be God's will? If, if any of you ask that question, what is God doing? How, how can this be God's will? Why is God allowing the coronavirus? Why... Is God allowing the government crackdown? What is the Lord up to? What is he, maybe this is the right question, what is he preparing us for? With all the churches shut down, how can that work together for good? And, and let, listen, don't quote me on this, and I'm not predicting anything, but I was thinking this morning about the great falling away that happens at the end of the age. I don't think there has been a time in 2,000 years of church history where all the churches all over the world are all shut down. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, that's never happened in church history. And I know people are staying at home, and I, listen, I'm not criticizing anyone who's staying home, especially if they have a pre-existing condition. But all the churches are shut down, and I know people are staying at home because of the virus. You say, well, this isn't the great falling away. This isn't apostasy. People aren't turning away from the faith. Maybe not yet. 
But what is God doing in all of this? How can this work together for good? You know what? I have, I have an answer for this. You know what my answer is? Why is God doing all this? I have no earthly idea. Okay? That's, that's my answer. Because sometimes and oftentimes, God's people don't know what the Lord is doing. Now, can I, can I speculate maybe a little bit? I could speculate. And I could say that God will use this to bring us all closer together. I like to think that's what's going to happen. And I think I've already seen some of that. Because we're talking to people and communicating with people we haven't communicated with in a while. So maybe the Lord is going to bring us closer together. Uh, maybe it will, and it's already doing it, force churches to put their sermons and content online because when it's online, just like the printing press led to the expansion of the gospel, whether you like the internet or not, it leads to the expansion of the gospel. And now all churches are basically forced to put their content online. I think that's a good thing. And you know me, I'm kind of old fashioned. Innovation oftentimes comes as the result of challenge and difficulty. So there could be innovations that we, we don't even know about yet. And as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> this will cause some churches to shut down and to shut down permanently. You say, well, I thought you were focusing on the good things that are going to come from it. These bastions of unbelief and false doctrine, some of these churches, if they do close, that'll be a good thing. And there's some good people, I don't know why they're there, but there are some good people in some of these churches that God is working on. And when those churches that spread unbelief close down, what are they going to do? The people who really are seeking God, what are they going to do? They're going to find a Bible-believing church that's still open. Amen? So these are some thoughts. But, you know, I admit, I, I don't know what the Lord is doing. But I'm sure interested to see what he is going to do. So there's some mystery in all of this. And it's true that the Lord does work in mysterious ways. I know that's not a Bible verse, but I think it's true. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. If God wants us to know something, he'll, he'll tell us. But until then, what do we do? We walk by faith and not by sight so we don't know what God is doing hopefully one day we can look back and understand but while we are in the midst of it all we need to remain hopeful we need to remain faithful stay engaged our trust in the Lord needs to remain steadfast when you start feeling anxious or stressed out, which no doubt some of you have, I mean, that's normal based on everything that's going on. That's the time where you remember what the Lord instructed in Psalm 46, verse 10. Remember, he says, be still and know that I am God. Some of you don't have any choice. You have to be still a lot more than you were before. So make the most of it. Be still and know that Jehovah is God. And all things do work out for the good of God's people. And they work out to the glorification of God's name. Now, back to John chapter 12, there was great expectation. There was great mystery. The disciples, they didn't know what to expect. There was fear. Okay, the disciples were fearful. Jesus said he was going away. The religious leaders were fearful. <clears throat> John chapter 12, verse 12, again, it says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, 
Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And his disciples, what does it say? did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. So verse 15 is a prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. No riding in on a white horse. That's what Jesus is going to do in Revelation 19. That's when he rides in on the white horse. The first time Jesus came in humility. Just as King David, who was the anointed one, King David had humble beginnings. David's son, the Messiah, the Christ, he would also and did have humble beginnings, but then he would be exalted as the great king of Israel and Jesus, of course, the king of kings. But once again, we see the disciples did not understand. Verse 16 says that they did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered. Now, please turn a few chapters ahead to John chapter 14. <clears throat> John chapter 14. I think it's important to point out uh, that all along the way, Jesus was preparing his disciples. And again, what is God preparing us for? We don't know. But all the while, through the Gospels, Jesus is preparing. Don't ever think, well, this is just... One day after another, after another, nothing's going. No, God is preparing you. If you're paying attention, God is preparing you. Amen. But he would prepare the disciples. He did that. He never just threw them into a situation without first giving them what they needed and telling them what they needed to hear. Again, the false prophets tell people what they want to hear. Jesus told people what they needed to hear. And it wasn't always an easy thing to hear. But when someone loves you, that's what they're willing to do. They're willing to tell you things that are not always easy to hear. If G and just think about this. If Jesus told the disciples or he just did what they wanted, if he just told them what they wanted to hear, there would be no cross. If there's no cross, there's no resurrection, no resurrection, no ascension into heaven, no mediating between us and God. So remember, the disciples at this time before Jesus was crucified, they did not get it. John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus talks about him and God the Father as if they're one. Well, that's because they are. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, and let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and am coming back to you. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Amen. So Jesus says, I'm going away. And that makes them sorrowful. It makes them fearful. But he says, I'm coming back. That's the expectation. That's the source of the disciples' hope is the source of our hope. Matter of fact, it's called the blessed hope, that Jesus is 
going to come back. But did you notice what Jesus said to the disciples? He said that the Father will send the Holy Spirit, and it is the Spirit who will teach you all things. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. Now, we need to be a little careful here and not take some of these things out of context like some people do. Like in John chapter or yeah, John chapter 16, I believe it is, where Jesus tells the disciples that the Spirit would lead them into all truth. Remember that? I'm sorry, that's not a personal guarantee that you will be led into all truth. So you have a personal guarantee from the Almighty to be right about everything. Okay, that's that's not what he means. But yes, the Holy Spirit was sent. Uh, he was their teacher. He is our teacher. If you hear any truths from the Word of God today, you know, I might be the human messenger, but if you hear the, the Word of God and, and it's illuminated to where you understand something that you didn't before, and it, it's applied, it strikes you in such a way, you know what that's like, right? You read the Bible and it's, it, it hits you. Or you say, I've never seen that before. How did I not understand? That's the Holy Spirit teaching you. And certainly whenever a person hears the gospel and they understand for the first time and their spirit is regenerated, that's obviously the work of the Holy Spirit. So he is our teacher. He opens our eyes. He gives people ears to hear. He opens the heart in true faith and regeneration, and he sanctifies our spirits. So that's all true. But remember, who is Jesus speaking directly to here in John 14? Who is he speaking to directly? So this is first and foremost a promise to the apostles that the Holy Spirit would teach them all things and bring to their remembrance all things that he had said to them. Now turn back to John chapter 12, and I'm getting to the point here, okay? And I bring it up for this reason. So once you're back at John chapter 12, I want you to look at verse 16. It says, His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. How did they remember? Yeah, I mean, did they, what did they just put the pieces together? You know, it was, it was just hindsight, their own intellect. No, it was God, the Holy Spirit, who showed it to them. You know, there are millions upon millions of people that know that it's Palm Sunday. There's countless numbers of people in this world that know that Jesus died on a cross. But do they understand it? Even now, with all the information, uh, Bibles available, commentaries, all the content online, you know, people still don't get it. Why? Well, first, they don't, some people don't care, but ultimately the, the real reason is God the Holy Spirit has not opened their eyes. That's the reason. And why not? A lot could be said say, well, they, they don't want their eyes to be open. You know, don't think that the Jews didn't know about the Passover. The Jews that rejected Jesus, they knew about the Passover. They knew about the lamb. They knew about sacrifice. They knew about God's judgment. The story of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness because of sin and rebellion. Didn't every Jew know that story? You don't think they knew about the sacrificial system and what it represented, why the animals were offered? Of course they knew these things. Given all that information and given the fact that John the Baptist was the most popular preacher in the land and, uh, land, and what did he say about Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. With all that information, why couldn't anybody figure out what was happening? Nobody could figure it out. Even the disciples, when they were told, they could not 
figure it out. They had Psalm 22. They had Isaiah 53. It was like it's all spelled out for you. They still didn't get it. I wonder what does the church today not get? What do we not understand? Remember what Jesus said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus? O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? They should have known. The people should have known. The disciples should have understood. But again, it's not about your comprehension. It's not about how smart you are. It's not about the degrees you have. It's about, has God the Holy Spirit opened your eyes in your heart? Just skip down to verse 35 of John chapter 12. It says, Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. And he who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. And these things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, what does it say? They did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, don't miss this, therefore, they could not believe. Because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. A lot of people have read through the Gospel of John. They haven't understood what does he say? While you have the light, believe the light. Believe so that you may become sons of the light. So if a person continues to reject, the, here's the scary part. If a person continues to reject the truth, there comes a time when, according to verse 39, they cannot believe. Now, it's a little different, right? It's, it's true. These are people. He's talking about people in Jesus' day who saw him. They saw his miracles. Even Jesus' enemies didn't deny the miracles. You remember what they did? They attributed the miracles of Christ to who? Yeah, essentially to Satan, which was the unpardonable sin. An utter rejection of the Son of God when all the evidence is right there before you. So it is, admittedly, a little different today. Jesus is not walking among us. We are not eyewitnesses to his miracles in that way. But there are still many, many people, they have all the information right in front of them. And you know what? Deep down in their heart, they know that it's true. And what do they do? They continue not to believe. They continue not to turn to Christ in repentance. And there does come a time, and I don't know when this time is in the life of each individual, there comes a time where they cannot believe. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 55. You remember in Genesis 6, the Lord says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. In other words, there comes a time where God's grace, for lack of a better term, runs out. So prior to the triumphal entry, uh, Jesus, remember what Jesus did before this? He, he wept over the city of Jerusalem because God's judgment was coming. They had plenty of time. They had all the information they needed. They continued in rejection and... Time was running out. Isaiah 55, verse 6. 
And, th and if anyone is here or whether someone listens to this later on on the radio or whatever, if, if that, you know, like this is describing me. Like I've been put, I know it's true. I've been putting it off. I'm not doing anything about it. Here's, here's a word for you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. This is what God will do. He will show love and mercy and grace and abundantly pardon. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways or nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. He continues, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall be, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth and it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So when Jesus rode in to the city of Jerusalem and the people uh, cried out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, you know what happened? Their own words condemn them. Remember, God's word does not return to him void. It, uh, it either edifies or builds up, brings salvation, or it brings condemnation. And why do I say that their own words condemn them? Weren't they saying something good? They were praising Jesus as the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yeah, well, it was about a week later, a little less, that they were crying out what? They professed that they knew he was the Christ. And then, a few days later, they cried out, crucify him. You say, well, it might not have been the same people. Well, I'm sure in some cases it, it was, in some cases it wasn't. But we began this chapter by reading about Judas, right? Here was a man who gave his life to follow Jesus. And we read about how he complained about the ointment that wasn't sold to the poor. And what did Jesus do? Jesus rebuked Judas. He basically says, leave her alone. And that was the final straw that likely led Judas to betray Christ. <clears throat> what does that show? People are fickle. You know, they'll praise you one moment, stab you in the back the next. They'll say, I believe in Jesus. Then they'll deny Jesus. I love, I love you. I hate you. I mean, this is the way people are. I believe. No, I don't. So... What was Jesus doing in his triumphal entry? So before we conclude, I just want to read from one commentator who said this. By this action, Jesus presented himself officially to the nation as the Messiah, the Son of God. The Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish authority, and other Jewish leaders wanted him dead, but they did not want to kill him during the Passover time because they feared stirring up the multitudes with whom Jesus was popular. Jesus entered the city, however, on his own time and forced the whole issue in order that it might happen exactly on the Passover day when the lambs were being sacrificed. As the scripture says, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. It all happened on the very day, the day that God has ordained. And you know how we say, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That's talking about the day Jesus was crucified. And that day was the Lord's doing, the psalmist says. And it is marvelous in our eyes. But, the people, they didn't understand. 
It must be the Holy Spirit who brings illumination. God's word does not return to him void. So seek the Lord while he may be found. I'd just like to close with some thoughts about our current culture and the current crisis. What is God doing? You know, the people praising Jesus on Palm Sunday again had no clue, no clue what was ahead of them. Peter, James, John, they, they had no idea what, what I mean, we, all, we know the story. They had no idea what they were about to face. Jesus did, though. The truth is, we have no idea what next week will bring. Never mind next month or a year from now. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Maybe, okay, maybe, God is using this to get people's attention. Amen. What is the Lord trying to say? Maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't understand. But it is God the Holy Spirit who will lead you. It is God the Holy Spirit who will guide you. It is ultimately God the Holy Spirit who will bring understanding and illumination. So, in light of all of that, seek the Lord while he may be found. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord, you need to do it now. And if you've done that, but you know you've been wandering... Now is the time to come back. And if you've been withholding forgiveness for someone else of something that someone's done for you, now is the time to lay those burdens down. A lot of people have extra time on their hands, so how are you going to use it? Are you going to be in the Word and in prayer? Are you going to call a friend? Send a letter to a family member you haven't seen or talked to in a while. Are we going to be praying for those in authority, whether we agree with some of the things they're doing or not? Are we going to listen to and apply biblical preaching? For the Lord has promised, remember, his word will not return to him void. So I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. God has made us promises, and we need to be awake, sober, vigilant, because the next few weeks and months, who knows? So we need to take these things seriously, but above all, we need to take the Lord seriously. Amen. We need to take the gospel seriously. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would... Keep your promise, which I know you will, that your word will not return to you void. So I would ask you to use it for whatever uh, goal, whatever it is you want to accomplish, Lord. I just ask that each heart, each person here, each person listening later on would receive a blessing. And if there's someone who's continuing to live in rejection, I just ask that you would Bring understanding to their heart and mind that they are a sinner who is in need of your saving grace through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen.